e tira forte il vento su una vecchia terrazza davanti al golfo di Surriente un uomo abbraccia una ragazza dopo che aveva pianto poi si schiarisce la voce e ricomincia il canto te voglio bene ma tanto tanto bene è una catena ormai che scioglie il sangue in mezzo al mare penso le notti là in America ma erano solo della mutare e la bianca scia dunelica senti il dolore della musica si alzò dal piano forte ma quando vide la luna uscire da una nuvola mi sembrò più dolce anche l'amore Guardò negli occhi la ragazza, quegli occhi verdi come il mare. Poi all'improvviso uscì una lacrima e lui credette da affogare. Potenza della lirica, dove ogni dramma è un falso. E con un po' di trucco e con la mimica puoi diventare un altro. Ma due occhi che ti guardano, così vicini e veri, ti fanno scordare le parole, confondono i pensieri. Così diventa tutto piccolo anche le notti là in America. Ti volti e vedi la tua vita come la scia dunelica. Ma sì, è la vita che finisce, ma lui non ci pensò poi tanto. Anzi, si sentiva già felice e ricominciò il suo canto. Te voglio bene assai, ma tanto, tanto bene assai, è una catena ormai, che scioglie il sangue di te. Memorial 
for Matt. And also a very warm welcome if you are joining us on YouTube, such as the modern technology. We are going all over the world, so uh, it's good to have you with us. I have to say, uh, looking around, I feel my entire youth flying before me. Um, so many people, we were talking before the service, and Jenny and, um, and Rosie and uh, all sorts of people, um, Myra, uh, and of course, Matt was very much in that world. You, it seemed to be whatever show you went to see, there was Matt in it. So uh, it's, it's a great honor for me to, to be here today to, to remember him, and, uh, uh, and it's good to have you um, with us today. Um, and I'm sure, and he was a looker, wasn't he? I mean, he really was, you know. Um, he really was. And that's before we even get started on the Thunderbirds. <laughs> um, and I'm sure Matt's gathered around him people from all faiths and, and perhaps from none, but if it's within your tradition, I invite you to join with me now in a prayer. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Today we come together to remember before God our brother Matt, to give thanks for his life, and to comfort one another in sorrow. Father in heaven, we thank you because you have made us in your own image and give us gifts in body, mind and spirit. We thank you now for Matt, for what he meant to each one gathered here. As we honour his memory, make us more aware that you are the one from whom comes every perfect gift, including the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> now, <laughs> says here, <laughs> uh, we're all going to sing. We're going to sing. It's not a hymn. Well, it is a sort of hymn, in a way. Um, anyway, you've got to sing up. I mean, looking around, there's, there's some pretty good singers, so we'll be all right. Um, but you've got to sing up, uh, because we're going to sing tomorrow. Speak of me as you have always done. Remember the good times, laughter and fun. I'll be with you in the summer sun. And when the winter's chill has come, I'll be the voice that whispers in the breeze. I'm peaceful now. Put your mind at ease. I've rested my eyes and gone to sleep. But memories we've shared are yours to keep. Sometimes our final days may be a test. But remember me when I was at my best. Although things may not be the same, don't be afraid to use my name. Let your sorrow last for just a while. Comfort each other and try to smile. 
I've lived a life full of joy and fun. Live on now. Make me proud of what you'll become. And now we've got Juliet, Guy, and Stephen Kilby, Matt's adopted family. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our celebration of our darling Matt's life. I'm Juliet, this is my husband Guy, and this is our son Stephen. Shirley and Matt were two halves of the whole and were so important to me for my whole life, but how did that come to pass? Many moons ago, Shirley sang with my late mother Iris Kells while my father, Stephen Arlen, was managing director of the English National Opera and he was effectively the boss of my mother and Shirley. Matt came on the scene when he married Shirley and they all became solid friends. When my father passed away in 1972, Matt proved to be an even bigger part of my life and he became a father figure to me and uh, had to endure a lot of tough times from me. He was someone who could turn to in difficult moments and someone who could make me laugh when nobody else could. He <laughs> I loved his endless, hilarious anecdotes and all the times he embarrassed me in public with his wild antics. <laughs> I loved watching him perform on and off stage and I loved the way he could get the entire hospital world singing with him and I while he danced down the middle of it. Um, I loved all the silly things we did whenever he was with us and the times he broke into song for no reason, which again I did at the hospital um, and yet him and I entertained everybody. Um, I loved his famous shortcuts that took us twice as long to get anywhere. Um, and he was such a good driver, as everybody knows. Um, I love that he, his car was getting smaller and smaller. As, it, as <laughs> I love that he wouldn't take any nonsense from anyone and let them have it in both barrels. Matt could do no wrong in my eyes, so I'm guilty of encouraging his juvenile behaviour because he was mad and he never held it in, and nor should he have done. They broke the mould when they made my mat, and I was privileged and grateful to have been able to spend so much quality time with him, taking nonsense Talk. and making, talking nonsense, and his unique brand of nonsense, <laughs> along with my own. So, 40 years ago, aged 15, I met my wife when I left school to start college. Of course, I didn't realise Juliet was going to be my wife at that point, but that didn't stop me from being thrown headlong into the fun-loving lives of Shirley and Matt, his gorgeous Shirley. This proved to be a big life lesson for me, as I'd never before met a bigger piss-taker than myself. <laughs> I, used to, I used to think I was quite funny, but Matt quickly taught me what it was to be truly funny, and I soon learned that I could never outprank him. My apprenticeship had begun. We joined forces to play jokes on poor Shirley at every opportunity, which resulted in her lovingly nicknaming me the little shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he got away scot-free with everything. Only much later did I realise that's because he was blaming me for everything. <laughs> Matt, Matt had become family to me and he featured heavily in my life for four decades. He was there for all family events, making everybody laugh. He was the main attraction at our wedding, making everybody laugh. When Stephen was born, he even came to the hospital and made everybody laugh. <laughs> And whenever we went to see his latest musical, there he was on stage, making everybody laugh. So what do I remember most about Matt? His love of making people laugh, which was so good for the soul, and inspired me to find humour in everything. And for that, I am blessed to have known and loved him. The other side of Matt, though, was his humility. A few years ago, we introduced a dear friend to him because his late father had painted his favourite Thunderbird 3 on his childhood bedroom ceiling and so Matt's voice was extra special to him. Matt duly signed some pictures, posed for photos and took time to chat with him, making his day. Later I asked Matt if he ever got fed up with fans wanting to meet him and asking him to sign Thunderbird pictures and I'll never forget his reply. I can shake a stranger's hand, he said, and scribble my name on a photo and give them so much pleasure they can never forget. So I'm blessed with a priceless gift for which I'm forever grateful and I never take it for granted. Matt always asked after our friend, by name, following that meeting, and for his 60th birthday during lockdown, Matt recorded a personal message to him from Alan Tracy, which I know will be treasured for the rest of his life. That friend is watching today on a live stream from Spain. You know who you are. 
but I can assure all of you that he is testament to the pleasure that Matt brought since into the life of everyone he met. So thank you, Matt, for the laughter and the joy you gave us all. Tracy Island is a quieter place without you, my friend. Well, this dad didn't think would ever come, really. <laughs> Very strange. Um, Matt was a part of my life from birth, um, and yeah, as my parents have said, he's been a key part of our family unit. Um, all of us who knew him well knew that he could be a very stubborn person. He'd rather buy a new car than replace a set of tyres. He'd rather throw away a coffee machine every time he ran out of pods. But in reality, <laughs> it was his personality that made him a special person, as well as cranky. From the moment he walked into any room, he commanded everybody's attention. If you knew him well, you were used to it. But kind of as my dad alluded to, you were occasionally reminded of just how much he meant to people and just how charismatic he was when he was with other people that he'd never met. Everybody who'd never met him before was fascinated by him. He had a charm. He had that special ability to be able to tell the same story thousands of times and be just as humorous and engaging every time. I know I always used to laugh every time he told the same stories and I would even you know, come up with... Uh, you know, questions every time we saw him and, and, and get him to tell the same ones. Um, he was a big kid uh, and from, you know, for some reason throughout my childhood I kind of always thought he was 52. <laughs> he just never seemed to age. <laughs> I genuinely remember asking mum when he must have been early 70s, yeah. how old is he actually? <laughs> and being really shocked. <laughs> really early shocked. 90s. Well, early 90s. Um, <laughs> But, you know, for that reason, I think he would have been great if he was an actor. Um, he could sing and dance. Um, he should have always taken to the stage. Throughout my life, every family gathering was made memorable in some way by him. And for that, I feel hugely thankful and privileged. There are people around the world who would give an arm and leg just to shake his hand. Uh, yeah, I was able to spend countless hours with him and share some of the most important days of my life in his presence. While he could be cranky, unpredictable and hard to pin down, we loved him for it. He always kept us on our toes. For 20 straight years, he would leave us on our tent hooks every October, November, and December as to whether he'd be available for Christmas. <laughs> he would always have this better offer, this mystical thing in his back pocket, but he would always turn up. <laughs> he never did go to Canada for Christmas. <laughs> Sorry, or Vienna. <laughs> or Vienna, or Prague, or, you know, or Italy. <laughs> He would read the same stories, he would drink the same coffee, he would eat the same number of sausages, though never as many as me, and he would pretend to be filled with the same gifts each year. And you know what, I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't think he would either. So thank you, Matt. Thank you for everything. Um, before we go, a slight departure from the running order. Um, we had a late um, request from Ian and Michelle Lavender who is sadly unable to be with us today. Um, but they've asked me just to read this short tribute to Matt as it was um, uh, very important and didn't want it to be missed out. So this one's for you, Ian. Uh, please excuse the voices, because otherwise you won't know when he's talking. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best. Zimmerman, it's quite often an advantage to have a name that starts with a Z. That was just one of Matt's round the supper table comments one evening before we'd even got to the main course. The conversation hadn't stalled. It never did with Matt and Shirley anywhere near. What was he going to do when she went? Half the double act no longer there. Well, as we know, she went, but she was never gone, for which we give and gave thanks. We still had Matt and my Shirley, uh, but you can't say goodbye to Matt without including Shirley. What advantages are those, darling? Well, you never called first on an audition list, so you get most of the day to prepare. It's my belief that Matt was born prepared, not to merely audition, but to perform. When his bottom was slapped to provoke the first sound after delivery, he didn't cry. He probably bawled, there's no business like show business. <laughs> you want more advantages? The last page of address books, telephone directories, are usually the first to get ripped out. You rarely get cold callers from another continent offering you to clean your computer or builders from Basildon selling double glazing. Matt, and debt collectors, they never, <laughs> they never get to the end of their daily list. How else can I afford to have my computer cleaned by a builder from Basildon? <laughs> Matt, we don't have a computer. <laughs> What's that got to do with it, Shirley? Is there any more soup, please? <laughs> Together they were our own George and Gracie. 
And when he had to go solo, Matt was arguably the sixth Marx brother. A brother who loved us and hundreds more, and our boys almost as though they were his own, and who made us all laugh and smile. Matt was one of the few people I've known who was put on earth to make sure every other person had a good time. So often we hoped the evening would never end, and the inevitability of saying goodnight was always a happy sadness. And the inevitability of Matt no longer being here, well, another happy sadness. Thank you, Ian and Michelle. And now I'd like to hand over to Rosie and Paul. Thank you all. Zimmerman and Ian Marshall Fisher by Ian Marshall Fisher. I became aware of Matt in the 80s when I saw a show called Spin the Wheel. He stood out with his great American accent, energy, clarity, and drive like a train driver, Matt could drive a scene. By 1990, I had put into action my project, Lost Music project focusing on major American theatre writers and their neglected work. Matt jumped into my mind as a go-to person. As the project focuses on American writing, whenever possible, I welcome North American performers. Americans don't just come with an accent, they have an inbuilt rhythm, a 
and American drive when it comes to reading an American life. It's a cultural thing. Matt must have appeared in at least 12 lost musicals. I enjoyed his spirit and his many contributions during our rehearsal process. He was a huge asset and great to be with. And he always got what I was doing, and so we had a shorthand of communication. As for the man, I have a personal story. After one of our performances at the Barbican, which Matt had appeared in, the audience and many of us connected with the show gathered in the bar. I spotted his wife, Shirley. They had met back in the late 50s when, as a mezzo with a good reputation, she sang at Sadler's Well. Shirley and I chatted about how great Matt had been in the show. I told her that I always looked forward to him being in a show because apart from his ability, I liked him. I must have triggered something as there was a change of mood. Out of the blue, she told me that they had been unable to have children. It appears that every time she fell pregnant, she would lose the baby. I remember listening quietly while everybody was buzzing around talking the show for me, giving me full focus. She quietly carried on. I had just lost another baby and was so depressed and down. This particular morning, I had gone up and went to have a bath. Matt had got up early and had dressed ready to go out for a voiceover job. I was lying in the bath, brooding and feeling extremely low when I heard Matt's voice calling out. I'm off, goodbye, see you later. <laughs> After a moment, he repeated the phrase. I, I can't remember if I responded. Suddenly, the bathroom door swung open and there he stood, clearly catching my mood. Sitting in that water, I looked up at him. He stood and stared at me as if knowing exactly how I felt, fully dressed, with his shoes on, he began stepping into the bath <laughs> and somehow crouching down in front of me and finding some space to give me a huge hug. Shirley didn't comment on how they got out of the bath <laughs> or him drying off and getting redressed. She wanted me to know what a kind person Matt was. As her husband, Understanding, kind, and unusually special. How the world can change, it can change like that Due to one little word, Mary See a palace rise from a two-roomed flat Due to one little word, Mary And the old despair that was up and there suddenly ceases to be. For you wake one day, look around and say, somebody wonderful man. change it can change like that due to one little word Mary see a palace rise from a two-room flat due to one little word Mary and the old despair that was all Look around and say 
Well, follow that, as they say, <laughs> and I can't. Um, it's left me too emotional. Everyone that... Start again. I'll make it short, anyway. For those of you that know me, will probably know that Matt and I go back many, many years. I met him when I was 18 through my boyfriend and husband-to-be, Clifton Todd. A lot of you will know him, too. Matt, his darling wife, Shirley, Clifton and I, became a very close foursome. Matt and Shirley had a wonderful marriage, and I can remember thinking that I wanted ours to be that way. Fun, laughter, and their taste in furnishings, etc. <laughs> I loved their style. We had great holiday breaks together and spent every Christmas Eve for years at their lovely flat in Islington, and then their many houses. They moved quite a few times. Clifton chose Matt to be his best man. And I know you can all imagine how we couldn't have had anyone better. He was wonderful. Even when our two girls came along, they were such a fun aunt and uncle. And they too have their own wonderful memories and great stories. Of course, I remember our Christmas Eves in particular, as Matt's trees were something to behold, if any of you have ever seen them. They were truly magnificent. He would spend hours decorating the whole house with fantastic candles. Beautiful. Thinking of Christmas trees, I remember one year, Matt and a friend carried a very large tree home on the tube and got away with it by telling the authorities that they were from Candid Camera. <laughs> Do you remember Candid Camera? It was hysterical, but only Matt, right? Another time, he faked a heart attack in the middle of a shoe store that we were in. He left the poor manager in such a state, it was just the most awful thing. But again, only Matt. He got away with these things. I could go on and on, but we haven't the time today. And I'm sure that you all have all your own wonderful stories about Matt. He was a truly one-off, a very unique guy, talented and oh so much fun to be with. We will all miss him more than words can say, but I'm comforted to think that he is reunited with his darling Shirley and they are laughing hard at all of us coping with this strange world that we are left to live in. God bless you, dearest Matt.
So, oh, this is so amazing to be here today and all your wonderful experiences and hearing about Matt and getting into the bath with all his clothes on. I mean, wow. <laughs> could just imagine that. Um, I'm actually, I'm the daughter of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson who, who created Thunderbirds and I was prepared to come here and tell you how he actually got the part of Alan Tracy, but I've just heard that he's going to tell us later, so he's upstaged me again. <laughs> Typical. Anyway, so I won't go into that, but it's a very funny story, and he actually thought my mother was a bit nuts, which, of course, you know, we won't say any anymore. <laughs> anyway, so my mum, Sylvia, was the person responsible for creating all the elements of the characters for the long line of, you know, the, the TV series, Super Mario Nation. And she was so passionate that she wouldn't, you couldn't bear to have any element wrong. So to the point, they started filming Thunderbirds without casting the role of Alan. So the first episode was filmed with Alan given a, just one line provided by another actor. So she, she carried on searching and searching and she just, you know, she couldn't find that because she was very sort of particular about that. And then David Holliday, who's playing Virgil, suggested somebody he was on stage with at the time who was a musical actor by the name of Matt Zimmerman. And he said, you know, he may be a good fit. So it was the chance suggestion that created the famous pilot of Thunderbird 3. I mean, I've got to tell you, throughout my childhood, I, I used to attend all the voiceover recording sessions for the many shows that my parents produced. And I was, you know, a kid, sort of wide-eyed kid, listening. And the, the recordings were so good and so fabulous and gave me an insight into the whole sort of industry. And Matt was particularly kind and used to come out and check on me and go, well, what are you doing? You're drawing a nice picture there. <laughs> you know, and I remember that yeah. so well, so typical of him. So... There were various people in on those Sundays, and it was a horrible, grey trading estate, because my mum used to love Hollywood movies and had ambitions of going to Hollywood. But she said, I nearly made it, except it was in Slough on the trading <laughs> estate. <laughs> so there were people like Nicholas Parsons, Lois Maxwell, Francis Matthews, Stanley Unwin, and it was a real melting pot of actors who, who just loved... The, the relaxed nature of the recordings. And in between recording, the exciting dialogue, I mean, no, known to so many, stand by for action, and Thunderbirds are go. Sorry, that was a really bad term. <laughs> the actors also vie for attention uh, to show who was the funniest. And this was a, a habit that Matt actually never lost, because five decades later, he was still getting into friendly disputes with his um, co-stars, Thunderbirds co-stars, about who could tell the funniest joke. So as Thunderbirds progressed, my mum, she became increasingly fond of Matt, as you can imagine, and the character of Alan Tracy. And from one, just one line provided by another actor, the character's importance grew, as did the number of lines he got, which he course, enjoyed. <laughs> and it didn't distress him too much. Um, by the time the two Thunderbirds films, Thunderbirds Ago and Thunderbirds 6, in 66 and 67, Alan was firmly established at the forefront of the action, including a memorable dream sequence in which Alan is whisked off by Lady Penelope, played by my mother, <laughs> and they watch a puppet of Cliff Richard sing in a nightclub in space. <laughs> now, if he didn't think that my mum was mad at the audition, he most certainly did when he got that script. <laughs> so the production life of Thunderbirds was relatively short, believe it or not, but its legacy endured for decades, and Alan's boyish enthusiasm would live on in Matt. And when I last saw him a couple of years ago at a Thunderbirds fan event, he leapt onto the stage in his mid-80s with the energy of a 25-year-old. Matt did countless jobs after Thunderbirds, but his love for the puppet counterpart never seemed to dwindle, and neither did the fans' love for him. Whatever job would follow, 
he would always be Alan Tracy. And I hope whatever adventure he's on now, it's as exciting as the ones he left behind for the children. So FAB, Matt. <laughs> FAB. Get a radish, never any doubt. That's why I love vegetables, you know what you're about. Plant a turnip, get a turnip, maybe you'll get two. That's why I love vegetables, you know that they'll come through. They're dependable, they're befriendable, they're the best pal a parent's ever known. Wild children, it's bewildering. You don't know until the seed is nearly grown Just what you've sown So plant a carrot, get a carrot, not a Brussels sprout That's why I love vegetables, you know what you're about Life is merry, if it's very vegetarian A man who plants a garden is a very happy man Stop, get a beanstalk just the same as Jack. Then, if you don't like it, you can always take it back. But if your issue doesn't kiss you, then I wish you luck. For once you planted children, you're absolutely stuck. Every turn of green, every kidney bean, every plant grows according to the blunt. While with progeny, it's hot progeny. For as soon as you think you know what kind you've got, it's what they're not. So plant a cabbage, get a cabbage, not a sauerkraut. That's why I love vegetables, you know what you're about. Life is very, if it's very vegetarian. A man who plants a garden is a very happy man. It's such a privilege to be, uh, to be speaking at this tribute to Matt. Um, so, Matt Zimmerman, the man who turned down an offer from Laurence Olivier in 1961 to join the company at the new National Theatre, concerned by the £12 per week on offer. <laughs> Having recently graduated from London, he soon found success with an offer to join the company of a new West End musical, earning a huge... £45 per week. However, this musical was the original London production of West Side Story, in which Matt was to understudy Tony. Matt was to play Tony for Bill Kenwright's production of West Side Story on tour and then at the Shaftesbury Theatre. Many years later, he did achieve his national theatre dreams, playing Mr. in Sunday in the Park with George in 1990. In 1989, Matt and I joined the cast of Anything Goes at the Prince Edward. Matt taking over from Bernard Cribbins as Moonface Martin. I was covering John Barrowman in his first West End role. Matt brought such joy to the show with his wonderful comic, energetic acting and gravelly voice. Our company had the great honor to perform alongside Elaine Page for the Queen Mother's 90th birthday gala at the Palladium. While working together on Anything Goes, Matt asked me to join his murder mystery improvisation company, Murder My Lord, for a number of fun gigs at some wonderful locations including Leeds Castle, Windsor Great Park, and Dorney Court. My character, Rico Francini, was supposedly a controversial nightclub owner and drug dealer but usually a red herring within the murder scenario. Matt 
would play a rather dowdy but convincing waitress, Doris, <laughs> helping occasionally with the genuine waiting staff, but revealing himself loudly with that unmistakable voice as the detective once the deed had been done. At the end of his Poirot-esque investigation and expose of the murderers, he would drop character and introduce us, his company of actors, and finally, his opportunity to bask in his great acting credit, announcing, and I was the voice of Alan Tracy in Thunderbirds, <laughs> much to the thrill of the crowd. In 2003, Matt toured along with Carl and Darren in Crazy For You, and then with Carl and Jenny Logan in Cabaret, playing Herr Schultz opposite Jenny, which you heard earlier. More of Matt's West End theatre credits include Annie Get Your Gun with Susie Quattro, City of Angels, Windy City. He was alternate to Henry Goodman as Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof of the Savoy. And most memorably, playing the film director Roscoe Dexter in Singing in the Rain with Tommy Steele. He would actually name one of his dogs Dexter after his character. Whenever we met, he would always greet me with such warmth. My first memory of Matt was seeing him playing Bert Healy in Annie. Bert's song, You're Never Fully Dressed Without a Smile, feels so perfect for the man with the widest smile and the kindest heart. God bless you, Matt. what you are Unforgettable Though near or far Like a song of love that clings to me How the thought of you does things to me Never before has someone been more unforgettable in every way and forevermore that's how you stay That's why, darling, it's incredible that someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too. forevermore that's how you stay that's why darling it's incredible that someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too
some on four panel all over the evening and then lick it off. Uh, I'll leave that one with you. Um, you've laughed a lot and it says something about a man who lived to a great age and you've cried a lot and that says a lot about Matt. And I particularly like the Christmas tree story actually. Um, not least because uh, last Christmas there were no Christmas trees left in Covent Garden. So my husband and I had to buy a Christmas tree in Clerkenwell and take it all the way to Covent Garden on a Boris bike. But I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think of saying we were with cameras in camera. It would, <laughs> would have been good. Uh, before we finish, just a couple of bits of um, housekeeping. First of all, uh, we do have a bar. I'm one of the few vicars in the country who has a license. <laughs> but not to kill, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, and my gorgeous assistant at the back will help you to raise a glass to Matt uh, after the service. Uh, there will also be a collection for the Actors Benevolent Fund. Um, if you'd like to make a contribution, it's very simple. You take out your wallet, you take out your donation, you fold it up and you put it <laughs> in the basket. Uh, you can also do this with puppies and that one. Um, and finally, you have been very good at applauding. Uh, so, 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 some people think it's rude at the Clapham Church, I need to have a say why, but this is the Acts Church, whose walls need, demand applause. So I suggest you get to your feet and give Matt Zimmerman one final standing ovation. not for ourselves alone but also for those whom we love but who are hidden from us by the shadow of death that as we believe your power to have raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead so may we trust your power and love to give eternal life to all who believe and so may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and all whom you love and care for this day and always. I was in a show at the Savoy Theatre called High Spirits. My friend, David Holliday, was already in some of this. He'd been cast. He phoned me and he said, look, they're looking for an Alan Tracy. Contact Sylvia Anderson. So I phoned Sylvia Anderson's office, made an appointment for the next day. When I arrived, her secretary said to me, Sylvia's waiting for you. So I opened Sylvia's office door, and she was sitting behind a desk, and Alan was sitting on top of the desk, the puppet. And before I could say anything, she said, don't speak, don't speak. I went, came and sat down. She said, oh my God. She said, if I didn't know better, I'd say this dummy was made to look like you on purpose. <laughs> Thank you. You know, made to look like me on purpose. She said, you've got the high cheekbones, the cleft in the chin, the big uh, eyes are not blue, but you've got big eyes, and, but you're not blonde. I said, my God, you do look very much like the, like the dummy. I said, thanks. And uh, so she says, say something. So I said, hello, Sylvia. My name is Matt Zimmerman. She says, that's, that's the voice. That's the voice. And that's how I got the job, through Sylvia. Of course, then later on, I met Jerry, who scared the shit out of me. He scared the shit out of me. Stand by for black dog.
These are some of the vehicles that we use when we're out on rescue operations. Well, of course, these are just some of our minor crafts. In just a moment, you'll see something much more impressive. Thunderbird 1 to Helijet. Get that last man off the rig fast. Virgil, get clear. What about Gordon? Thunderbird 4. The rig's gonna blow. Move fast. <laughs> 